Hello everyone and welcome back over to the DM side. Now, as you can see, we have a bit of a change in the setup once again. Throughout these monster videos, you'll probably see various different changes and that's because I'm really trying to figure out how to best utilize the space to give you the best quality content that I can provide. Now, it is quite a tricky space because it is quite large. So there's always that risk of echo. So I've noticed in previous videos, there's been the sound of the aircon or maybe the fridge or just general echo of the sound bouncing around the room, as well as when I've gone to turn the gain down and try and uh, mitigate this problem, it's been too quiet. And so you haven't been able to really hear me even with all your devices turned all the way up. So then going back to the echoey area, I'd, it's been pretty tricky. So this is a new attempt. What I've decided is I've still got the camera microphone going, but I've also set up my computer with this beautiful little uh, Yeti Nano sitting here. Now I'm really hoping that by having this here, I can synchronize the two clips and have a more crisp, clean sound because this microphone is closer to my mouth. So. Comment down below, how does it sound in your end? Because I am trying to learn different ways to fix this problem. Obviously changing the space would be preferable, but there's not much that I can do in that um, area right now. Also comment down below if you yourself have any suggestions that I have yet to try or haven't even thought of, I'd love to hear them. But now that that's over, let's get straight into the video. So we are continuing our journey on through the Monster Manual and today we are looking at Celestials. As always, give this video a thumbs up, comment down below your favorite Celestial at the end of the video, and subscribe if you would like to see more D&D content. But let's jump into it. So our very first celestial on the list is a pretty common one in most fantasy and mythology. It is the winged horse, the Pegasus. Now these great celestial beings are just as intelligent as the average humanoid. So they can really contribute to your actual campaign. But how do you include them in a low level to high level campaign? Well, the best thing is their backstory. These creatures actually come from the far realm where the elven gods reside, a place known as the Olympian Glades of Aborea. And usually they're actually sent down to the material plane where they sometimes will actually nest, but they're also sent down to aid heroes where needed. Now, these creatures are not just mere mindless horses for your players to actually ride and tame because they're intelligent to actually ride a pegasus you need to create this lifelong bond with them they're not as simple as a hippogriff or a griffin or um, a wyvern even good luck trying to ride one of those those things are crazy but the main point is these are awesome awesome celestial beings that you can use in both high and low level um, situations on your low level you could have your players basically be sent off to help protect a nest of pegasus, baby pegasi basically, from poachers. And that could translate much, much later on in their high level campaigns where perhaps they are in a bit of a pickle. They're in a place where they've overstepped their boundaries. They actually aren't at the level they need to be to win and survive this battle. And they're on death's door. The elven gods or the ones that they saved many moons ago could come flying in and be a means for escape for your players. Heck, maybe you actually want to run a... Uh, a campaign where all your players are playing holy knights and so they are actually gifted these flying creatures to take the fight to the enemy uh, in the skies much later on down the track. What I'm saying is don't count them out because they're a CR2 and don't count them out just because they're celestial and you're not sure how they can come into the story. These creatures are rare for sure. So make them rare and make them matter. All right, moving on now. We uh, we started low with the Pegasus, but let's keep in the horse round because our next one is the unicorn. Yes, again, another very well-known uh, creature in a lot of different mythologies. But again, a celestial being, how do you include this in a game? Well, first of all, these creatures are extremely powerful depending on obviously what level your players are at and how long you've been playing for. But they are protectors of forests. They have magical abilities. They can cure the wounded. They will willingly help good natured characters. So if you have anyone who is secretly evil or even perhaps uh, chaotic neutral, 
and they run into a unicorn, it could treat them in a different way, which could actually show the other party members that there's something quite off about that particular player, should you wish to kind of seed that for later on down the track. But how do you use them in a campaign? Now, because they are of celestial being, obviously you would like them to be somewhere quite prominent and very important. And unicorns, again, are protectors of forests and generally will be deep in a forest where uh, lush green grows and you know you could have them be protected by a druid perhaps you have been hired to actually go in and capture this creature because maybe you're not playing a good natured campaign and on the vice versa perhaps you are playing a good natured campaign and so you, the druid has come for help for those who can help protect the unicorn and maybe it needs to escape because poachers have found it. I know I've gone on with this poacher thing for the Pegasus, but it's a good low level introduction where you don't really have to fight this good natured uh, beast or this celestial being, but you do get to witness it and have it be part of your campaign. Now, again, they are godly creatures. They are usually sent by gods as a means to strike fear into evil. You know, so you could have a, a paladin that is of of good nature, lawful good nature, who's about to fly down or move down into a battlefield filled with devils and demons. Have his god or her god or their god send in a unicorn for them to ride into battle. Give your players advantage. Give your players um, inspiration should they come up with a way to attain this creature and have it be part of the party for this battle. Unicorns are amazing creatures because they can cast uh, healing spells and they have this aura about them where they're able to protect those that are of good nature. So DMs, I highly encourage you, put your players in a situation where they think perhaps they will die and then have a unicorn save them. Have a forest wilt and fall and become this murky swamp because rumors have it that a unicorn was slain there. But in reality, it's actually been captured and is deep underground in the Underdark and has been uh, chained there. And this, it is a source of power now. And your players need to free it so that way this disgusting swamp area can grow and flourish once more. Again, celestial beings are fantastic. You just have to have the confidence to know when and where to put them. Check out the unicorns, check out the Pegasus. Now, in the world of D&D, gods, demons, and devils usually are the ones that control the fates and the and decide how things turn out in the end. But even their otherworldly powers sometimes are no match for things such as prophecy. Now, in uh, your DM backstories, in your player backstories, or in your DM main storyline, sometimes we like to weave in these cryptic messages, cryptic storylines, and uh, missing puzzles that really bring that value and that juice to your backstory or to your main story. So why not also include and accompany it with a creature, a celestial being that literally lives and breathes prophecy? These creatures are known as the Coatl, these great serpents, serpent creatures with wings that rarely are seen in their true form because they have the ability to polymorph into anything they need. So usually they'll take the form of a helpful NPC, whether it's a humanoid uh, or even sometimes uh, a creature that will just lure them along the path, helping them complete the prophecy that they believe is theirs to complete. Aquatal does have a natural ability to actually shield its mind and its emotions from any prying spells, including things such as finding their location like a scrying spell, things that would break through and read their minds. Um, the, the spell um, escapes me at the moment, but I know there are some spells that can obviously uh, read surface thoughts and pry further and further into your actual thoughts. But the Quattle have this innate ability to reject that. So they're extremely secretive and only ever really reveal themselves in great, um, great times of trouble. But how can you include these in your campaign? Now, obviously, you could definitely throw them in as part of a main story plot point as a knowledge bearer, a knowledge giver, um, helping close off or tie up loose ends for a prophecy or even one to provide a prophecy to your players to help them continue their story. That could be the hook for your main uh, storyline. As a DM, you could even offer it to a player who's having a little bit of trouble figuring out what their backstory could be or just how to spice it up a bit. Again, adding a prophecy or adding the image of this creature for them to find later down the track. 
if you really wish to have them in your campaign where they actually meet with them and perhaps do battle with them, these creatures do protect um, great knowledge hordes. And so even with your characters going there with good intentions, the Coatl could actually see them as a threat and defend their, their lair. Now, Coatls are not to be uh, trifled with as they can, when biting into your players, should they succeed, they can inject a poison into them, which is relatively difficult to actually heal and they'll continue taking damage from there on. But I would highly recommend that you definitely throw them into some form of space for a lower campaign for them to be knowledge givers. Um, and then in your higher levels, perhaps you could even go about a route of needing to collect things like their feathers or scales, not killing the creature, but, you know, maybe you need them for spells, rituals. Um, you've been hired to collect these items. Perhaps your players will go ahead and just do the deed and kill the creature for their, uh, for their scales and feathers. But again, that's up to your party. I'm not here to tell them how to play the game. I'm just offering you a really cool creature to put in your story. The Coatl is awesome. In a play, in a game that I played, my player became something known as the Coatl Herald. Completely made up character with these made up um, magical items. It was amazing. And it just gave my rundown um, wretched character this new lease on life, essentially. So it's a good character development moment. DMs, play around with it however you see fit. All right, so if the Quaddle is a bit of a lower level creature for you and you really want to beef up your um, celestial encounters, but you don't want to just go straight to pretty much gods, then the Karin are probably going to be very uh, good for your campaign. Now, they are definitely a lot stronger than the previous celestials we just spoke about. These creatures sport three legendary reactions. They have three legendary resistances as well, including lair actions, should your players go to their lairs. But where are their lairs? Well, I'll have you know, they generally will uh, find themselves living atop high, the highest of peaks, the highest mountains, some even living in the clouds. They sport a lavish lifestyle and love having all these magical items around. Basically think a hoarder, except it's magical items and it looks rich as just rich as so you really could play up this very um how do i put it this really high class celestial creature maybe your players go there again seeking knowledge celestials i do find are really good for providing exposition to your characters or giving them reason to interact with creatures of another plane that aren't basically demons and devils that have this evil backstory. You could have these creatures be good and your players go in as a neutral party and still be seen as an enemy. But back to the Karin, why are they so great? Well, these creatures themselves are ninth level spellcasters. So um, when I say high level, I'm talking proper high level. They are lawful good in their nature and to be honest with you DMs, this is the best thing about them. They are sometimes called the bringer of boons. So say you're running a high level campaign and your players have reached level 20. Where do you go from there? D&D doesn't really give us that map. There's nothing beyond level 20 except boons. You could have your players go in, see this creature, not to destroy them, but to actually work for them, to do a great deed for them. And in return, your players can be given a boon each because I find that the boons is where you will then uh, build and develop your characters more. You have to need, you'll need to look into the DMG. Uh, I think they're towards the back before or after the magical items, but that is a way that you can continue your story should you wish to um, progress further beyond level 20. And the Karin are a fantastic creature that can actually provide a story element that does give your players the ability to have these uh, these great gifts, basically. The gods themselves are no longer able to walk on the material plane for various reasons, which date back throughout the older editions of D&D and really are is a completely different series altogether for this channel later on in the future. But that's not to say their children can't. And that is right, the gods do themselves have children. One of the most famous D&D um, demigods, we'll say, is Nalkara, which is a child of um, Oril and Thrym, who back in the late 15th century actually owed uh, Halster Blackcloak a favor. But again, that's for a whole nother story, for a whole nother video. The children of the gods are known as the Imperium, and they are really second only to the gods. 
And these creatures, these celestial beings, hold so much weight and power in themselves that, for example, even their emotions don't only affect them, but the actual world around them. Should an Imperium feel great sorrow and sadness, the rain will actually flow as salt water falling from the sky. A whole forest might wilt and die in a matter of days. Whereas if they are experiencing great joy, then sunlight literally follows them no matter where they go. The spring time itself will actually grow even in areas where winter should be. Described as beautiful and statuesque, they are very proud of themselves and very self-assured. Now in battle, these creatures will annihilate most parties. Anything lower than level 15 probably isn't even a good idea to go up against one of these, uh, one of these celestial beings. Basically, they are immune to all non-magical damage, and they are resistant to all magical damage. Along with that, all of their attacks are considered magical, no matter what weapon they're using and where they pick it up from. So in battle, they are already extremely hardy. I haven't even gone about the fact that they have a very high AC. I believe it's 23, and then hit points to boot. Knowing that they have all of this on their side... They are very self-assured and will fight to the complete and utter end, never believing that they can truly be defeated. Should you find yourselves battling alongside the Imperium, however, you get these great boons. Basically, at the start of the battle, you are unable to be charmed or frightened, and you have advantage on all your ability checks and saving throws. Now, if you decide that you want to be their enemy, should you dare to do that, you best watch out for the fact that these creatures can literally leap into the sky and kind of like a superhero landing, smash very Thor-like their hammer into the ground, knocking anyone within 60 feet of them prone, provided you fail your saving throw. Along with that, they can also cast <clears throat> Fireball and Earthquake and Firestorm, I believe, which is just insane amount of damage, which you really don't want to be getting finding yourself standing in front of. Now, when would you ever use the Imperium in your story? Unfortunately for lower campaigns, it really just do it does come down to the fact that this would be another knowledge gathering. In my opinion, anything that has a high CR rating that is intelligent that you would like to use in your games, this is a moment for knowledge, it's a moment for deals to be made, and it is a moment for character backstory to be developed. Even though you may not fight them or these or even fight with these creatures, you will still have your players experience them. And half of D&D really is about this experience of a story. It's probably more than half, in my opinion. It's actually like 90% of it. Fighting is just part of the story that your players choose to do. So, in your high-level campaigns, chances are your players are playing are traveling. They're moving from different realm to realm because that's where the story can take them. They have this ability. They're, they are basically gods. But imagine the gods already can't come to the material plane, but you now, playing our traveling, kind of have a chance to go to their plane of existence, almost. It's a bit tricky to understand the difference between planes of existence and the afterlife, I guess. But the point is, imagine that your paladin doesn't lose their powers. However, things feel different, feel changed, and you realize that their god has vanished from the pantheon. Who better to ask for help than from their children? Maybe one of the Imperium have actually fallen and has decided that they wish to be the god of that realm now, that their parentage actually is not doing a good job, and they have conspired with demons and devils or other ill around the, around the world to actually take their throne, their seat of power. This can really open up an entire arc of storytelling for your campaign. So I would highly encourage you to use them either really early on and have this be like the end end goal of a 20, level 20 campaign, or have it introduce itself later on, depending on how your players go. All right, so that this is where we come to the end. I don't really have an honorable mention for Celestials because there really are only quite a few of them, and I really did handpick out the ones I thought were best to be used in your campaigns. However, do go and look at the Monster Manual, uh, whether it be on D&D Beyond or flick through the real book if you do have it, and pick and choose, read up on them. They can be really interesting backstory elements. They can be really interesting in-game elements or future ideas for higher levels. It really just depends on where your story is at and how you would like to actually use these creatures. Now, as I mentioned at the start of the video, if you've got this far, please feel free to give it a thumbs up to help the channel, subscribe for more D&D content, leave a comment on your favorite uh, Celestial, and let me know how was the sound quality 
with this setup. Currently, it feels pretty good. I do like the table. However, I want to make sure that the audio and the footage is clean and crisp because I want to entertain you. Now, next week, join me because we are looking at dragons. See ya.